Hey everyone, it's uh, Sunday, so I'm doing another video here. Um, if you watched last weekend, you know I, I'm starting a, a series of sort um, where I just kind of outline the, the basic foundations of my faith, the, the, the main principles, ideas, and doctrines behind um, my thought process, behind uh, my passions behind what drives me, behind what causes me to to write articles and 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 post Facebook posts and 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 do these videos. Um, so I, I I don't know. I was kind of excited last week to get into it, just to to kind of explain to everybody um, or anybody who watches these, you know, you know the the ideology behind what I say. And um, so before getting into it, as always, if you can't watch this live um, or if you can only watch part of it, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I'll have this posted on there shortly, Lord willing. And you can watch this and all my videos at your convenience. Uh, it's King Ram uh, K, or I'm sorry, King Ram 417 K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name 417. Uh, that's King Ram 417. And, um, so I, I had two kind of similarly titled articles um, when I was looking through these. I had uh, the one I did last weekend, which was called The Basic Foundations of My Faith. And then I have this one here that I wrote uh, back on June 15th, 2016, um, called My 555 Foundation. And at, at last week, when I was looking at that previous article, I was I was trying to figure out like what the difference uh, between the two is. Um, you know, and, and I think... What I came to was was last weekend's article, the basic foundations of my faith, um, was more the underlying principles um, behind what I believe and what drives me. Whereas this article here, which is very lengthy, um, and it's going to take me, I'm guessing, probably three weekends to get through it. Um, this one here I wrote as uh, the basic doctrines, the the basic teachings um the the basic um theological concepts uh that underlie and drive me the the things that I'm passionate about the things that that I would define myself as the things that drive me and um I think I wrote it because uh, a brother of mine was was uh had brought up before the the idea that um the number 555 kept coming up in his life and he thought it was kind of weird and and so that always stuck with me and then and then I just thought well you know I'm reformed in my theology and the reason I say I'm reformed is because I I believe in the five solas of the reformation and I think that's all that it would take to de determine oneself or define oneself as reformed is to subscribe to and believe in the five sola principles and and the five solas were a reformation of sorts as they broke away from Roman Catholicism, and um, so so I adhere to those. I believe those. I believe those are biblical. I believe they're beautiful. I believe um, that they brought the church out of an age of darkness and in, into an age of enlightenment and biblical understanding and um just much spiritual growth and 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 grasping and understanding the scriptures um so so i hold to and believe in those five solas and then i also um subscribe to the what is nicknamed calvinism um and and the basic guy or the sovereigns of or i'm sorry the doctrines of grace and um the concept of Calvinism is often um, defined with an acronym called TULIP, and, and that's five points. They were actually um, five uh, counter-arguments um, to Arminianism. Uh, I think his name was Joseph Arminius, and his followers um, had kind of broken away from Orthodox Christianity and had, had written five arguments uh, against what was being taught. Um, I can't remember which church, the Church of Norway or something like that, but um, it was basic Orthodox Christianity that, that was preached by, by the Reformers, people like Calvin, Luther, and, and so on and so forth. And, and so um, Arminius and his people were really pushing these five points, and so a council was held, um, I, I think it was the Council of Dort, um, 
where they, they brought these five arguments and the church studied it out in the scriptures and, and um, decried them, said, no, what, what you're teaching is wrong. It, it's, it's, it's erroneous. It's heresy. It goes against Orthodox Christianity. And, and so here's the, count, here's the biblical counterpoints to your five arguments. And those five points uh, later got uh, systematized into an acronym so people could easily remember it called TULIP. And so I subscribed to that. I, I, I subscribed to the five solas, so I, I would call myself Reformed. And I subscribed to the five points uh, of TULIP theology, so I would call myself a Calvinist. Um, in addition to that, um, as, as I was uh, writing this article, I said, well, are there, can I, can I really sum up um, in addition to the five solas and, and the five points of Calvinism, can I sum up the five modern day teachings or, or, or subjects that burn in my heart? Can I, can I encapsulate those in five points as well? Uh, just because it would be nice and neat uh, to write an article with the five solas, the five points of Calvinism, and my five uh, driving um, philosophies, doctrines. And um, I was able to do that. I was able to um, take the things that the Lord has laid on my heart um, from the beginning of salvation and, and, and really uh, these are five things that have caused me to study much, caused me to um, just diligently be in the word, caused me to self-examine uh, my preconceived ideas and and caused me to take stands uh, within the church body and to, to take take these stands on the these are hills that uh, so to speak I would die for these are principles these are ideas these are doctrines um, that I that I would vehemently stand for and uh, believe to be absolute truths and um, would give my life uh, for these truths I, you know I, I in other words, I will not compromise on these points, and I believe they're vital and important and need to be addressed within the church body. And so that's what this article is. I'm, I'm going through those five solas, the five points of Calvinism, and then and then my five uh, modern thought, my five modern doctrines. And that creates my five, five, five foundation, uh, the basic doctrines, the basic principles, the basic ideology behind um, what I do. These are the things that burn in my heart, the things that define me as a Christian, the things that drive me in, in my teaching ministry here. Um, and so we'll be laying those out here. And like I say, this is a really lengthy article. A lot of this is going to be repetitive. If you've been with me from the beginning and you've watched my videos, um, a lot of the information in the Calvinist part is going to be a recap of the three-part series I did on Calvinism. Um, and then uh, when we get to the five modern teachings, uh, a lot of that will be repetitive. I don't know if I've done a video on uh, creationism versus evolution yet. If not, I will in the future, and so that'll be touching on a lot of the same things. I also delve into Roman Catholicism. I did an extensive video series here a while back on Roman Catholicism, so a lot of that will be repetitive as well. Um, but I'm going to go through it and, and just, like I say, to, so if this is the only video you watch, um, or if this is where you start and then, and then you watch my future videos, you're going to understand my thought process. You're going to understand why I say what I do and, 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 and where I'm coming from. Um, as always, before jumping into it, I want to pray. Um, so if you guys want to pray with me, I, I'd appreciate it. How should I pray, Lord? Um, as always, I pray for great humility. I pray that you settle my heart. Um, and you give me serious, sober-mindedness and temperance, emotional temperance that you calm my emotions, still my heart, Lord, still my mind. Help me to look away from uh, the video itself and, and 
and self-focus on, on how well I might do or what I might say or who might be listening. Um, and instead, do this to glorify you and magnify you, Lord. And there is much, much scripture mentioned in here, and your word does not return void, Lord. And so I pray that, that you are glorified through the reading of your word here. Uh, that if anything I say is not true, Lord, if I'm in error, uh, that you guard the ears and the hearts of those that are listening. Um, that you correct me, Lord, that you bring correction, that you humble my heart and make me teachable, Lord. <laughs> I see the pride in my heart, Lord, the intellectual pride that I cling to, Lord, that I, in, in my heart I think so highly of myself, Lord. Um, break me of that, Lord, but please be gentle, Lord. I know that pride comes before a fall and, and, and chastisement is necessary, Lord, but I just ask that you be gentle and merciful in correcting me. Lord, help me to, to live a life worthy um, of proclaiming your word, Lord, of, of, of speaking your word to others, of, of having others turn their ear um, towards me and, and give heed to what I would have to say about the scriptures. Who, who am I, Lord? And if I'm in error, if I lead people astray, Lord, that is a terrifying thing and... <laughs> You said uh, teachers would, would uh, suffer the more severe consequences, Lord. And so I pray that you please protect me from, from leading anybody astray. That you give me careful discernment, Lord, and, and, and wisdom and understanding and, and humility, Lord. <laughs> I pray that you send a teacher, Lord, to, to correct me where I'm wrong, that you would give me ears to hear, that you would soften my heart, Lord. Just please break me of, of my pride, Lord. In gentleness, I, I fear the, the rod of correction, Lord, but I, I know what's necessary, and, and so I'm stuck in the middle of knowing I need it, but afraid of it, Lord. And, so in your wisdom and your gentleness and your mercy and your love, Lord, I ask that you just you, you gently correct me in ways that you know how. Be with me in this video, Lord. I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, the five solas. Um, forgive me, I'm, I'm drinking milk on the here and I don't know why I bought this and I got to get rid of it so I'm drinking it I would never recommend to anybody to drink pasteurized milk that you buy at the store it's not good for you the stuff that you know this wicked society we live in where for the love of money people put all sorts of garbage in the in our modern day products that we don't need so uh, don't judge me too harshly for drinking this All right, so the first of the five are the five solas. Sola Scriptura is the first one. And um, those are, when the Reformers wrote these, I'm not even sure who wrote this or who systematized these five points, but um, they often used Latin, and so that's what that is. Sola Scriptura, the word sola means alone. So Scriptura, Sola Scriptura means the Scriptures alone. And what that is, is this is a statement uh, regarding authority over a believer's life. Um, the Bible, and, and the reason, yet yeah, keep in mind that all of these uh, five points of the solas are uh, reformation. They're, they're counteracting the teachings of Roman Catholicism. Uh, Roman Catholicism started early as just a, uh, a, a part of, of Christianity. Uh, Christianity had different centers. Uh, you had Antioch, you had Jerusalem, you had uh, Constantinople, you had Jerusalem or um, Rome. And so <coughs> you had Christians in each of those sections. 
uh, like in, in, in Acts, we see Paul traveling and planting churches. And so as churches grew, um, leaderships took over. And um, from my understanding of history is that eventually you had bishop head bishops over each city. And um, when there was a question uh, within the church, when, when, when believers couldn't come to a common understanding, a, an agreement on what should or shouldn't be done or what the scriptures teach or what they don't teach, um, they would gather together in councils and, and decide what was true and what wasn't. Well, within that, I guess there was political influence like you know people started to jockey for power and within rome uh specifically that happened because uh when the roman empire collapsed uh the roman bishop gave himself all the titles that had belonged to the emperor claiming that he now had authority over the roman empire so you had roman catholicism the, the roman church starting as a Christian organization, but influenced by world, influenced by politics, and influenced by power and corruption. And so that corruption started to seep in uh, to Rome um, and, and from the very beginning. So, you know, in, in a lot of good things came out of early Roman, you know, like the Council of Nicaea and stuff like that. We and and the doctrine of the Trinity and and things like that. And so people who argue against those things will say, "Oh, those are Roman Catholic things." Well, the Roman Catholic system that we know today um, it didn't just appear in the form it is now. It progressive progressively um, corrupted. It 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 became corrupt over time. So. Um, and uh, these different false teachings, these different ideas were added in um, to Rome as, as she grew in power and, and grew, uh, it appears to be greedy and hungry for that political power, for that authority over the world. Um, to the point when we come to the 1500s, the time of the Reformation, um, where we were in what's called the Dark Ages. And everybody knows from history um, that that's what that period was called. And it's because the, the light of the Bible was removed. Rome had, at that point had been become so corrupted and so power hungry that she knew the things she taught weren't in the scriptures. And so she had to ban the scriptures so that people couldn't read it and understand it. And so she did her, her, um, uh, ceremonies and, and uh, religious, uh, you know, different, um, I wouldn't call it church activities. Their 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 temple worship or whatever was done in Latin, so people couldn't understand. They set up a hierarchy, so people would have to go to the priest um, to get understanding, so that they the the priest would hold power over people, and and so Rome became so corrupt that and then the Bibles weren't permitted to be written in common language. Uh, people were forbidden to own or read Bibles, and that's why we, it was the Dark Ages. When the Reformation came around, um, Islam had started persecuting um, the uh, Eastern Church, like uh, Constantinople and, and, and what, what be later became also corrupt, Eastern Orthodox. Um, but there was Christians there that fled the persecution of Islam and came into to the former Roman Empire, what was England. And they would bring the scriptures with them, the original Greek manuscripts uh, that, that Rome had hidden and forbidden people to read. Rome had its own um, manuscripts uh, that were corrupted and twisted to fit their dogma, to fit their doctrine. But now these Christians from, from the East came into England carrying with them the real scriptures. And so all of a sudden you had people who were hungry for God that were part of Rome. Uh, people like Martin Luther, um, who, 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 you know, they wanted to serve God. And so they just assumed, you know, what we've been taught our whole lives is that in the Roman Catholic Institute is how we do that. Well, all of a sudden they're getting their hands on the scriptures and they're reading the scriptures for themselves and seeing the errors within Rome. And, 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 and so, like, Luther didn't want to leave Rome. He wanted to fix Rome. And, and he wanted to reform the Catholic institution to, to fix the, the, what he saw as the, the corrupted Christian church. He thought it could be fixed. 
but it ended up where we it was so corrupt and so filthy that uh, they eventually came to know it as the Antichrist system, and they had to break away, and that's what Protestantism is. It's in protest, Protestant, that's what that word means, in protest of Rome. And so they had to break away. And, and so the, the whole Reformation, um, in order to simplify and systematize it, was summarized in these five points. And so the first one was Sola Scriptura. Rome claimed that, she, that, that the, the Pope and his bishops held, and, and also church tradition held authority over a believer's life. Um, they taught that there was three forms of authority. Uh, the Bible, which only her, which only she could interpret, um, the church traditions, which were also interpreted uh, by the hierarchy, and then popery, the Pope himself. So the Pope was made the supreme authority over the scriptures and tradition. And, and so the Reformation comes along and says, no, it's scriptures alone. Only the scriptures exist outside of man's corruption. They are supernatural. They are written by the breath of God through holy men writing as they're inspired by the Spirit, protected and preserved and purified by God himself so that they are the authority over our life. And that, that was in contradiction to Rome saying, no, the Pope is the authority. He will tell you what the Bible means and he will tell you uh, traditionally what you need to do in order to serve God. Um, so this sola scriptura is the Bible alone is the source of authority in this world. It alone stands apart, removed from the stains of humanity. It is free from error, corruption, lies, and misgivings. Uh, men are prone to mistakes and, and evil. You know, the Bible stands outside of that corruption, pure and untainted. It cannot be corrupted. It cannot be compromised. It is protected by God, sealed by God, um, delivered by God to us. It is God's word. God does not make mistakes. God does not lie. God does not commit evil. Men do. Um, even the most sincere men make mistakes and errors. So the scriptures alone are, are our authority. And that's the counteraction to all cults. All cults will tell you you have to listen to the leader. You have to listen to the church. Um, and, and, and true Christianity says that this is your source of authority. This is the only thing that determines uh, what you can and can't do and how you are to live a life pleasing to God. And, and so that was the source of the Reformation. Um, no man can claim authority over another's in matters of faith. You don't go to men for forgiveness of sins. You don't go to men to tell you what God has to say. You've got it for yourself. You can pick it up for yourself. You can hear from God yourself. The scriptures alone are the rule of law and the binding of man's conscience. Man must submit to the scriptures as his absolute authority. It holds all the answers for a godly life and, and a means to communion with God. The scriptures alone um, are the authority over us and they're how we learn what God has to say and, and how we learn who God is. Um, some scriptures to back that up. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, 2 Peter 1.21 For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Uh, Proverbs 36 Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Um, so we're not allowed to add to God's word any new teachings, new doctrines, only what is found in God's word. Um, Psalms 12, 6 through 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So there we have the promise of God that his word is pure and that he himself will preserve his words forever. 
Um, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, Matthew 4.4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Um, I'm not going to read it here because it's the longest chapter in the book, uh, but Psalms 119. Uh, you can read Psalm 119. It's a, it's a love letter to the word of God. It's so beautiful. It's, 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 a, it's a poem of love and, and worship um, showing uh, how important and, and beautiful and worthy the Word of God is. And all throughout there we see just beauty upon beauty about the Word of God. It's a living Word. This is, this is the very breath of God. This is God breathed. God spoke through man and put words on the pages to tell us who He is and what He does. And the beauty of this is when you're born again, when you have the Spirit within you, and you pick up these pages and you read, the Spirit of God himself ministers to you through the Word. He transforms you into the image of Christ. It's how we're sanctified. It's how we're conformed to the image of Christ. As we read about him, we become like him because it's a living Word. This Word reaches into our hearts and, and shows us who we are in relation to the Word. And, and, and the Word is everything to us. This is our standard. No man has authority over us. There is no man, no pope, no title, no bishop, no church leader who can hold authority over you and say, this is what you must do to please God, unless he's reading scripture. Because scriptures alone are the word of God. Um, Psalm 33, 4, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. Um, so the second point is solus Christus, which means Christ alone. Um, this is a statement regarding the means to which we are made righteous with God. It is only by the blood of Jesus Christ that sinners are reconciled to God. In his sacrificial death and resurrection alone is man redeemed. There are no other means of reaching heaven. There is nothing else necessary. There are no other ways um, to be made right with God. Only in Jesus Christ and him alone can an enemy of God, a sinner, uh, be reconciled to God. This counteracts the teaching of Rome and all the cults. Rome would teach um, that in addition to Christ, you have to follow certain religious precepts. You have to do what the priest says. Um, for instance, like the confessional booth where you have to go and confess your sins to a man. That's so blasphemous and wrong. God alone can forgive sins. Uh, but then he would prescribe to you, oh, go say ten Hail Marys and, and five uh, Our Fathers to, to, and, and do this you know, charitable act, do this penance to, to receive forgiveness. With the idea that if you don't do these, things you'll be damned to hell so that you have to do what the priest says in order to gain favor with God and you know you have to go and kneel before the altar and you have to go and do these um, dam just ridiculous damnable um, legalistic additions to the gospel um, the truth is that Christ alone is our Savior he is the only way to heaven. There is nothing you can do. There are no other means. There is no religious activity or good deeds or good behavior that you can do to earn heaven because it's not up for you to earn. You're a sinner. You have violated God's rules. You, you've broken his commandments. And so justice is due to you. It doesn't matter what you do. You, you can go say all the Our Fathers and Hail Marys you want. Um, God is not a man that he's 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 um uh he can be bribed or that you can somehow please him through repetitive prayers that's nonsense um god requires justice he is good and holy and perfect and because we have violated his rules he demands that punishment be meted out that we receive the justice due to us 
Christ alone um, suffered and died upon the cross to bear our sins. Um, he took our sins upon him and he offers us salvation. It's through him alone, through faith in him alone, which we're going to get to, faith alone. Uh, but Jesus Christ alone is the only way to heaven. There are no other gods. There are no other deities. There are no other actions. There are no other deeds. Christ alone is the means to heaven. Um, some scriptures to back that up. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Uh, John 14.6 Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <laughs> Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, Rome, uh, which this antichrist system identifies a co-mediator. They say Mary is a co-mediator, that you can go to Mary to receive favor from God. That's blasphemy. Jesus said it, or I'm sorry, God... Um, said it right here in 1 Timothy 2, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Um, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. It is in Christ alone that we have forgiveness. You don't need a priest. You don't need to confess your sins to some man. You don't need the blessing of some self-professed pious monster wearing a, a fancy robe calling himself godly. Um, you, you just need Christ. And you'll learn that if you're in the scriptures, you're going to learn that. You're going to read these scriptures and you're going to see. And that's why Rome banned the scriptures. That's why it starts with Sola Scriptura. Because you're going to learn these things through the scriptures. That it is through Jesus Christ alone that we can have redemption. He's the one who paid the fine. He paid with his own blood that we can have redemption. That we can be mediated between. Uh, we had enmity with God because of our sin. Christ mediates that. He redeems us and reconciles us to God with forgiveness through his of our sins. Uh, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Atonement is payment for sins. Um, it's done. It's paid for. Jesus Christ alone. There's nothing more that needs to be done. There are no actions that need to be taken. There is no effort that we need to, to put forth. There are no religious deeds we need to do. Um, Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Um, the third one. Is sola, and forgive me for, for my mispronunciation here, I, I don't know how to speak Latin, but sola gratia, or, or yeah, uh, gratia, uh, which means grace alone. Um, this is a statement on the means uh, by which man is saved. If Christ alone is the Redeemer, then how do we receive that? It's through grace. There are no works or efforts that a man can put forth to earn God's favor or demand merit. It is solely based upon the goodness and love of God that he saves anyone. Man is dead in trespasses and sins um, and incapable of pleasing God. 
We are enemies of God, dead in our sins. When Adam sinned, we died spiritually so that we could not please God. We were set on destruction. Our hearts were selfish, going after selfish pursuits, unable to hear spiritual things, spiritually dead. Um, the only thing that we deserve is justice for our disobedience. But God chooses to save some, uh, not because of any quality or characteristic that exists in us, because we're all equally dead. There is nothing good in us that deserves to be saved, but because of his loving kindness. It is only this grace that saves a person. It is grace alone, no works. Um, whole sections of scriptures, when you read through the New Testament, um, define that, that works are in opposition to grace. If, if, if you're trying to earn God's favor, then, then grace no longer applies. That's the opposite of grace. Grace is unmerited favor, a giving to you of something you don't deserve. If you do something to earn it, then it's deserved. And, and it would no longer be grace, it would be works. And, and so the whole system of Roman Catholicism is based upon works redemption. It eliminates uh, grace. It says you need to do this, this, and this in order to get to heaven. You earn merit. As a matter of fact, when you pray to the saints or Mary in Roman Catholicism, you're earning merit so that they'll plead on your behalf. Um, and, and, and you can earn by being so good, um, listen to this kind of pagan nonsense they believe in. Um, you can actually store up excess grace, excess merit, um, that, that can then be put into some sort of mystical heavenly storage um, that can then be delivered to others. Um, so people like, you know, the, the people they name saints, like uh, Teresa, Mother Teresa, um, were supposedly so good they stored up extra grace that now you can, you can get some of that. And... Um, indulgences were sold. Uh, that's what caused Martin Luther to, to, to you know, uh, basically just uh, freak out against Roman Catholicism because they were selling grace. They were saying, um, if, if you give a certain amount of money, you can earn uh, favor. It was just ridiculous. They're making merchandise of men's souls. Um, so grace alone is saying there is nothing you can do. You're a guilty criminal. You deserve justice. Uh, but... Christ has paid the price with his own blood and his death and resurrection, and it can be given to you through grace, through God's unmerited favor. He will simply choose to have mercy upon people. He will simply choose to forgive their sins. He will simply choose to look at what his son has done and credit it to their account. Um, some verses to back that up. Uh, Romans 9, verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, and, and this is talking about salvation. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that sheweth mercy. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we did anything to earn God's favor, no matter how small it is, if, 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 if um, baptism were necessary for salvation and you got baptized and your neighbor didn't, you now have room to boast. You can now legalistically look down your nose at him and say, well, I've been baptized, have you? Or if you have to speak in tongues um, to be saved. And, and, and your neighbor hasn't, you can now look down your nose. Any sort of legalism, if you have to, to you know, to wear a suit to church, and uh, or going back to Roman Catholicism, if you have to do the sacraments, you know, you then have the, you, you know, you, in your heart, you can then uh, build up this uh, spiritual pride of sorts, where you look legalistically down your nose at somebody that hasn't done these things. And, and, and that comes across even in like Arminian type preaching, um, where people are saying, you have to make a decision, um, to choose to believe, um, I, I, cause that creates a pride too. That is a work. Then you did something you chose and your neighbor didn't. And so now you have room to boast over your neighbor. I chose, why didn't you? And then, and then preaching becomes more of, of guilt persuasion. You know, just make a decision, just make a decision, just choose to believe, you know, and that's not how salvation works. Salvation is grace. 
um, that, that God gives uh, based upon his decision. It's not of him who wills or of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. God chooses um, to have mercy upon some. And so then when salvation comes, it's a, it's a miraculous, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a unbelievable gift. Like, you know, I deserved nothing. Uh, how could I ever look down at my neighbor? I'm worse than my neighbor. Why would God have mercy on me? That becomes the, the you know, oh Lord, thank you so much. Please have mercy upon this one as well. Um, Romans 3, 24 through 28, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, Romans 11, 5 through 6. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Um, he's talking about how there's, there's Jews that are still being saved. There's, there's, there's chosen people. Um, not all of, uh, oh, sorry, I'd have to go back and read Romans 11, but he's coming out of this idea where he's been talking about, uh, the Jews. But the idea here is that, uh, it's not about keeping law. God has, has reserved for himself a people, um, both Jews and, and Gentiles. Um, so I'm picking up in verse six, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. He's saying work and grace are opposites. If you have to work to get something, if you have to do something to get to heaven, then it becomes earned. It becomes merited. It's no longer grace. Grace, uh, by necessity, disqualifies law. It disqualifies anything you can do. There is nothing you can do. You're dead. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. You've been doomed from birth. We've gone astray from the womb. Um, we're, we're, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. It takes a miraculous work of God to say, come to life, be alive here. And he does that through the preaching of the word. Uh, but it, when it comes, it's totally unmerited. There's nothing we did. There's nothing we earned. It, even, even the hearing and, and contemplating is given to us because those same words can land on one person and they just go about their day. They land upon another person and they're miraculously saved. Why this one and not this one? It's because there was a miracle done. God granted ears to hear. He granted understanding. He gave comprehension. He, in, he, he, he reinvigorated that heart to life. Um, Titus 3, 4 through 7. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Um, so it's, it's purely by the grace of God that we are saved. Um, the, the fourth point is... Sola fide, I think is how you say it. I'm not sure, uh, but it means faith alone. Um, this is a declaration on the means by which grace is applied. So if Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and resurrection um, are, is the only way to heaven, 
and we're all dead in trespasses and sins and can never hear or receive or understand this and that it takes grace that God has to just have mercy and enlighten our eyes and bring us to life. Faith is the means by which he distributes that grace. Faith is the way that he causes that grace to be received. And that's done by him as well. He gives the gift of faith. It is not something that's present within us because we're dead in trespasses and sins, incapable of doing any good. But God, through the preaching of the word, and, and when that word comes, when he decides to, with the power of the Holy Spirit, he regenerates that heart. He causes us to hear. He gives us eyes to see. And with that, he brings this gift of supernatural faith that recognizes the truth of what's being preached, that recognizes the truth of the word, and that clings to it as its only hope. And it's, it's through that faith, the, the, the grace comes and imparts faith, which then clings clings to that grace, um, which is actually, you know, it, through the grace, clings to Jesus Christ. Um, so the sola fide, faith alone, is a declaration on the means by which grace is applied. Um, the whole idea on these five points of the Reformation is that salvation is by the sacrificial life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone granted to those God chooses solely based on his grace alone, and it's received and administered to us by faith alone um, for the ultimate purpose of God's glory alone, which will be the last point that we get to. Um, this faith is not merely believing. It's not just intellectually um, assenting to these truths. Just It's not just... Uh, recognizing the truth of these things and believing in them, accepting them as truth. Uh, because even the demons believe, and they're not saved. James 2.19 tells us that, that even the demons believe. Um, this faith is a supernatural faith. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. It is his faith, the faith that he had while on earth. The faith that, that existed in him, and now that he is resurrected, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, it brings the faith of Jesus Christ. That same faith that it was in him and is in him is imparted into us. Um, and it's gift, it's gifted to us. It's it's given to us by grace. It is the means uh, by which grace is applied. It is the gift of God. And it brings with it that regeneration, that new life, that new heart, that new nature. It causes the, the dead spiritual life in us to be resurrected. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So when Jesus Christ comes, when his faith comes into your heart, through the preaching of the word, empowered by the Spirit, um, it causes regeneration, it causes new life, it causes eternal life. Um, it is a faith that does not suspect it's, that there might be a God. Um, it's not a faith that hopes and desires that there might be a God and that they might get to heaven. It's a faith that knows God. It is a real substance of things hoped for and manifested evidence of invisible things. Substance and evidence are tangible things, not merely speculation. It is real and it cannot come from within man because we are spiritually dead. We don't have it in us. Um, it's a gift from God. It comes upon us. Faith is given when the word is preached and the timing of God is correct and the spirit chooses and God uh, chooses to enlighten your heart. He imparts to you this supernatural gift of faith that doesn't just speculate and doesn't just believe and just doesn't intellectually accept these things as true. It is a knowledge of God. It is a reality that exists beyond the five senses. It is, it is a, a, we walk by faith, not by sight. It is knowing God. That's, that's why a person who is truly born again 
can never, ever, ever lose their salvation. You can't unknow something. Once you know Jesus Christ, once you know him more than you know anybody else, it's intimate. P people think they're Christians because they go to church and because they intellectually accept these ideas. They say, yes, I believe the Bible. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. Yes, I believe he, he gave his life. But it's all intellectual. It's, 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 it's not knowing. They don't know the king of the universe. And that's why Jesus tells those people in Matthew 7. They come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. you this faith that is given, it is a reality. It, it's imparted into your heart that... that um, it, it, you can't explain, uh, but all the born again know it. Um, you know the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, in, 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 an, in, in your mind, in a way that exists beyond the senses. You have communion with him. You've experienced him. You know the reality. It's, it's, it's when you see the sun, nothing can convince you that that doesn't exist. You can't unknow that. You've seen it. You've experienced it. When you experience the sun, you can't un just undo. You can't just choose. To, oh, I no longer know you. I can't just the people I know in my life. I can't just choose to say I no longer know them. I know them. And so the born again, when they know Jesus Christ, they are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. They know the Lord. And when they know the Lord, that comes with a knowledge of who they are, where they were heading, the justice they deserved. It comes with an understanding of what God has done for them. And it clings to Jesus Christ with everything it has, knowing that he is the only means of salvation, that, that he has given his life for me, that he is precious, that he is holy, that he is more than everything else. Everything else is dung compared to this. Nothing else matters anymore. I've seen the king of the universe. I've seen the one. And so you cling to him with all you have. And that is the what the faith that is given. Um, when, when God grants that faith, it's not something that you intrinsically have within yourself that you can just stir up and decide through your own willpower to believe. No, that's not. It, it comes through the preaching of the word through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, in the predestining election of God, that he enlightens eyes and imparts this gift of faith. Uh, the verses to back that up are uh, Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Uh, Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Um, again, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, Romans 4.5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 9.30 What shall we say then? that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Uh, Galatians 3.24 Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Um, that idea there is that the law, the, the keeping of the law, 
and and the, the proclaiming of the law, do this, don't do that, here's what holiness is, here's what it's not, is meant to bring us to Christ. It's meant to show us our need of a Savior. It's meant to show, I can't do these things. I can't, I can't be holy. I can't do what God requires of me. What am I to do? I need a Savior. That's what the law does. That's why we preach the law, to, to, so that the Spirit may bring conviction and reveal to people their hearts, so that they'll come to the Savior. And then once they come to the Savior, they're justified by faith, not by the keeping of the law. All right, and so then the last one is uh, sola, or soli dea gloria which means to God alone be the glory. Um, so the whole point of existence is for the glory of God. This whole scheme of salvation is so that God will be glorified. Um, th it, this is the idea that everything that happens, everything that occurs in this universe is designed and purposed for God's glory. Um, it's, it's, it's to reveal him, to show him, to reveal his quality, to reveal his character, to reveal him. Um, it is the entirety of creation, the very reason that all things exist. Every molecule and every action is designed to give God glory. Um, and the beautiful thing about that is that that fulfills our purpose. That's what we're made for. We are made to bring glory to God. So when we do what we're made to do, this fills us with satisfaction and joy. Um, that's what uh, Pastor John Piper preaches, what he calls Christian hedonism. Hedonism is this idea of do what makes you happy. Christian hedonism is that... Um, Ultimately, God's glory is what makes us happy. So yes, do what makes you happy. Glorify God. Bring glory to God and you will be satisfied. You will be filled with joy. You will be filled with contentment and peace. And you can see that on Pastor John Piper's face when he preaches. You can see um, here's a man who has embraced this, that, that knows his purpose to glorify God. And you can see the joy and satisfaction in it. Um, all things, especially in this context that we've been talking about, the, the salvation of man is to magnify and exalt the glory of God. Um, in the face of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus is the revelation of God. And, and so it's, it's all meant to bring glory um, to the name above all names, the Savior of all, all mankind, Jesus Christ, the preeminent one, um, the one above everything. Uh, Romans, uh, or here's the scriptures to back it up. Uh, Romans 11.36, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Uh, Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31 uh, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, 1 Peter 4.11 um, well, just the idea there on that previous verse, when you whatever you do, uh, do to the glory of God, and that's that's learning righteousness and holiness. So that everything, like when I drink this milk, you know, I ought to be able to do this for the glory of God. Thinking about how He has provided for me, how He has given the miracle of milk, even though man has tainted this and and poisoned this, but the the original idea, and and praise God that He protects us from the poisons. But how, how he's made things to like quench my thirst, to um, to eliminate that parch, that, that cotton mouth that comes from speaking, the the glory of God in that. How he's how he's given me a voice um, to 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 do a video, um, to 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 speak of him. 
Um, you know, he's given a shirt that, that, that can bring glory to him. That, that also, you know, brings me warmth and comfort. Um, just everything that he's done, everything we do is to bring him glory. And, and so when we fail to do that, it's actually sin, you know, and we're not doing what we're supposed to do in, in, in glorifying him. Uh, first Peter four eleven. if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In Ephesians 3.21, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Um, just without thinking about that verse, uh, unto him be glory in the church. Like that's the church's function. Um, and, you know, is to, to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, so that's what I got there. Uh, this is part one of my 555 Foundation. Those are the, the five solas of the Reformation, um, which I adhere to. And I, I believe to be the totality of um uh, of salvation the totality of purpose there it, it's all um synchronized and, and succinctly put into into these bullet points um if, if you're catching this at the end and you didn't get to watch the whole thing um subscribe to my youtube channel uh, i'll try to get this posted here right away you can watch it and all my videos at your convenience uh, it's king ram 417 that's k my middle initial ingram my last name 417 and uh, we'll continue on with this 555 found it, 555 Foundation Part 2 next week, uh, Lord willing. All right, thanks for watching, guys. I love you. Talk to you later.